Now, there are all sorts of additional issues for us to uh, try and address. There's tech rivalry. There's the question of the use of tech for good and for bad. We'll be talking about those things uh, this afternoon and through tomorrow's program too. We won't be able to get to everything in every session, but we have uh, to launch our afternoon a really special opportunity. We have two of our colleagues uh, from the Asia Society who work in trying to globalize education, who are very busy at this and have a great deal of experience. The Asia Society's Center for Global Education is a remarkable institution, and we've been connected in a couple of different ways for a long time. There are a lot of resources there that you need to avail yourselves of. Now, our two speakers work at the center. Uh, the first of the speakers is Dr. Anthony, Anthony Jackson. And Anthony uh, earned a degree in California, went to Michigan, and is now serving with the Asia Society. I got to know him very briefly about 18 years ago. Uh, we were involved in a project out at Southgate uh, International Studies Learning Center. It was a remarkable, a remarkable program that the Asia Society was running, and I had an opportunity to meet Tony at that time. Now, following Tony's presentation, Dr. Jackson's presentation, we're going to hear from Dr. Uh, Neelam Chowdhury, and she too works at the Center for Global Education, where she's the head of the Global Learning Program. Neelam has done a lot of different things. She's been in the classroom, and she's also worked for an organization called uh, Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship. And that is a key idea uh, for this workshop, looking at getting our students thinking creatively. How can they contribute? What kind of difference might they make? And so, Without further ado, it's time for me to turn things over uh, first to Dr. Jackson. Please go right ahead. Well, good afternoon and thanks very much, Clay. I really appreciate that uh, introduction and it's good to see you again. Um, and by the way, that school that we uh, worked at 18 years ago is still part of our community of internationally, uh, internationally focused schools that we work with. So the work goes on. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to be with you this afternoon. Um, I, uh, as, as was said, um, I am the director of the Center for Global Education uh, at Asia Society, and um, it is really so nice to be a part of this new partnership between Asia Society's Center for San, Fran uh, San Francisco Center um, and the 1990 Institute. Um, we at the center have been kind of the mainstay of education at Asia Society for decades, and it's really great that our colleagues in San Francisco are now joining us uh, in that work in a really big way. Um, our, our work at the Center for Global Education, as Clay said, has uh, been primarily focused on advancing the concept of global competence as an essential aspect of education and helping schools with resources and training to build capacity to, to develop globally competent youth. Um, I'll say more about uh, what we mean by global competence in a minute, and my, my colleague Neelam uh, will, I'm sure, speak to how we do that capacity building uh, in just a few minutes as well. But I'd like to put that work in the context of uh, what's going on in our world right now. Um, it's my sense that we are at a real inflection point in our country and in our world, um, the outcome of which will make an enormous difference in the future. So the title of my talk is Education for a 22nd Century. Now, not long ago, a great man died. Uh, and here I'm, I'm not talking about John Lewis, although he was indeed a very great man whom I had the pleasure of meeting and saying to him um, face to face, especially as a black American, that he was, he was truly one of my heroes as one black American to another, but that's what I mean. Um, but um, the person I'm referring to is uh, also one of my heroes, but one I kind of doubt that you have heard of. Uh, his name was David Hamburg. Um, David was the president of Carnegie Corporation of New York, where I worked as a program officer for um, about 10 years. And he was a psychiatrist by training, but a profoundly uh, insightful Renaissance big picture thinker, ranging from everything from adolescent development to race relations to the prevention of nuclear war. 
And one of his real gifts to me was the notion of looking at things and, and trying to make sense of things uh, through the lens of evolution. From an evolutionary perspective, all that really matters is survival. Uh, whether or not uh, any species survives and thrives depends on how it adapts to the context within which it exists. And for humans, um, the locus of adaptability has shifted over time from physical characteristics to mental capacities. So put simply, nowadays, human survival depends on how we act based on how we think. Now, at a huge risk of over oversimplification, how we humans uh, think can be dichotomized into two computing worldviews. Um, at the core of one of these views is the understanding that in the natural order of things, there are winners and losers. Uh, some people are stronger and, and smarter and faster or in myriad other ways capable of achieving hegemony over others. And in this view, it is legitimate for them to do so. It's just the way things are and always have been. And this perspective might be called the dominance paradigm. The competing worldview also recognizes that people and a society is differ in profound ways, but these differences do not require or legitimize dominance of one person over another or one group over another. Instead, the natural way to think and act towards others is to consider them on a level with ourselves equally deserving of that which enables anyone to survive and to thrive. In this view, we might call the egalitarian paradigm. These two worldviews have been exist have existed since time immemorial between and across groups and frankly within any one person. Um, at any point in time, one or the other of these ways of perceiving and organizing the world may hold sway uh, in influencing behavior. But the evidence of human history to this moment argues that the dominance paradigm, um, that worldview has far more often served as the kind of primary operational paradigm in the minds of men and the actions of societies. So globally, um, I think we find ourselves in an epoch of growing dominance mindedness. Um, as in periods past, inequities in power and privilege are today leading to gross disparities in the resources required, if not to survive, than to live with some semblance of, um, of well-being. And as in the past, these growing excesses and inequality are buttressed by a legitimizing view that it's just the natural order of things for some to have more than others, be it wealth or power or both. The Black Lives Matter uprising is at its heart, the unleashing of the pent up rage among, uh, against the dominance paradigm manifest in America as white supremacy by black people who have been systematically subjugated for hundreds of years. It is a reaction against the supreme act of white supremacy where police officer Derek Chauvin stopped the breath and the life of George Floyd, never thinking for a moment that he was not in full compliance with the law and with the norms of our culture, a culture of sanctioned dominance of white people over others. We're at an inflection point because it's that worldview that's now being challenged, not just excesses in police brutality. And it's being challenged not just in the United States, but worldwide in places where nationalism and colonialism and other forms of culturally sanctioned group hegemony have existed for decades, if not centuries. Unfortunately, there are also places where new forms of hegemony are becoming even more deeply rooted. The primacy, primacy of the dominance worldview extends to humans' interactions with nature and the planet as well. Um, that we are the masters of the universe and not its partners or its collaborators, even just its friends, reveals an understanding of the world as ours to own and to use and ultimately to abuse at will. The, um, the, the disturbing, one of the most disturbing aspects of the COVID-19 situation to me is that there are literally millions of people in our country for whom the reality of this environmental threat cannot penetrate their psychological defense mechanisms. There are people who seem to just believe that it is literally impossible for there to be something that supersedes their individual right to act as they see fit. Something that calls into question their ability to manip manipulate the world as they desire. And so that thing, the virus, must be a hoax. I have an educator and friend in, uh, in, in Florida who told me just the other day that her brother 
uh, insisted that the coronavirus will definitely disappear on the day after the election in November. Well, this comment belies the view that COVID-19 is just a storm we have to weather to get back to normal. In fact, thinking broadly about climate change and about in, uh, other environmental imbalances, COVID-19 is the harbinger of a season of storms over the coming years, increasingly more violent and unpredictable. Left unchecked, the obscene inequities of resources and the mentality that enables it, well, it's gonna be the death sentence for large numbers of the Earth's population. More people will starve, more people will die of disease, more people will kill each other. Yet while rising inequality will mean the end of the evolutionary trail for millions, it, it does not mean that humankind itself will end. As a species, there will be enormous misery because of these man-made inequities, but we will survive unless, of course, we go nuclear and then the party's over. Unfortunately for us in the 21st century, Mother Nature has called the question on the legitimacy of the dominance paradigm. Our interactions with the natural environment bring us now to the precipice of irreparable global harm that ultimately could lead to our extinction. If environmental degradation and biodiversity genocide are left uninterrupted, where will we be in 80 years at the dawn of the 22nd century? Where will, will we be at all? If there is to be a 22nd century worth living in, we have to both act and think differently. Our survival depends um, on the ascendancy of an egalitarian worldview and the subordination of the dominance paradigm. We must act to enable human beings from the very earliest stages of development as their minds are forming to contrast and uh, to construct reality from a more egalitarian uh, than dominant perspective. And, and that way that learning occurs, of course, through education, although done very differently than in the past and, and as it is in the present. What's needed is an education for a 22nd century, not to prepare us for the 22nd century, but to get us there. Now to get us there, uh, we need a profoundly different purpose for education. Its purpose would certainly not be simply the acquisition of facts and the capacity to apply scripted formulas, although these basic capacities play an important role toward the ultimate objective nor would the intent of a 22nd century education mimic the needed but ultimately insufficient redefinition of education for the 21st century, which calls for the development of complex thinking skills and socio-emotional capacities such as resilience, grit, and, and a growth mindset. What would dif differentiate a 22nd century education is its intention to develop in all youth an orientation towards people and nature that is more egalitarian than dominance-minded. If we are to survive as a species, education on a global scale must develop in youth the mindset and disposition to act more toward the common good than toward individual gain or group hegemony. So what would education for 22nd century look like? Well, I would offer that we at, at Asia Society, um, what we call education for global competence is at least a glimpse of, of what that might look like. In our work, we define global competence as the capacity and the disposition to understand and act on matters of global significance. And what's, uh, what's critical to realize from the very start is that students both develop and demonstrate global competence through rigorous study within academic disciplines. Students develop global competence not as an extracurricular activity, but in the way they study within the core curriculum. So in education for, for global competence, content knowledge and the understanding it brings matter. Uh, to help students understand their complex and diverse world, students need to know the seminal constructs that are contained in the ac academic disciplines. And they need to know how to think in the particular ways called for in those different disciplines. They need to think like historians and think like scientists and think like artists. And they need to think within the disciplines from a global perspective. So for example, we believe American students certainly need to know about the US civil rights movement in the 1950s and the 1960s. And they need to be able to understand uh, that, that civil rights movement even more deeply by comparing it to the truth and reconciliation movements in Chile or South Africa, or the struggle for nationhood in India. They need to do chemistry experiments to determine the caloric value of various foods and they need to be able to apply what they learn to understand world hunger. They need to learn about logarithms and exponential growth and be able to use this knowledge to explain the dynamics of population growth worldwide 
or predict the uh, trajectory of infection from the novel coronavirus if left unchecked. So the knowledge and understanding of the world developed through disciplinary and interdisciplinary study, that's the foundation for our definition of global competence. And what also matter uh, are, are the development of a range of cognitive and social and emotional capacities that enable students to access and act upon that knowledge and understanding. And we've grouped these capacities into kind of four big areas. Uh, the first is a capacity to investigate the world. And here we are in fact striving to develop the 21st century skills of critical reasoning and curiosity and problem solving, but learned and applied within a global context. So we help teachers help kids see how local and global issues are interconnected like the pandemic. We help them define and verify and use global information uh, sources to triangulate on the truth from different vantage points. And most of all, we develop a capacity to understand and address the world in its complexity. Second, we support teachers in engaging children in experiences designed to develop empathy and the ability to recognize and weigh others' perspectives. These are crucial ingredients to curate in youth a learned response to value others as potentially someone like me, instead of the more instinctive disposition to view others as inherently different and potentially a threat. To counter the innate psychological mechanism of othering that is at the heart of the dominance paradigm. Third, global competence is about the skills of cultural, uh, uh, cultural competency. The ability to recognize and respect cultural norms that may require shifts in how we relate to and communicate with people from different backgrounds than our own. It's about, it's about developing values of cultural humility and respect. And it's also about developing understanding of the value of technology to connect others globally and the danger of technology being used to silo us from one another in bubble chambers of misinformation. And finally, global competence is about developing youth a disposition to take action for the common good, to apply their cognitive skills and their habits of perception and interaction in, in ways that, that balance um, the, the value of a, of a goal with the consequences it has for the people and for the planet. So um, one thing that is true though, I will say for education in the 22nd century is something that's uh, equally true right now. And that is the centrality of teachers and the relationships with students that they develop. Um, relationships are the conduit through which learning occurs. And that's true in classrooms and it'll continue to be true in cyberspace as we pivot to distance learning. So that's why our work um, at, ages, at the center really uh, consists mostly of professional development for teachers to help transform their practice, building on their assets and talents to routinely produce more globally competent youth. Um, as providers of professional learning for teachers, we are embracing technology and how we create access to our resources and and how we connect directly to teachers. And I'm sure Neelam will have a bit more to say about that. And in classrooms, be they brick and mortar or, or on a Zoom screen, education for the 22nd century will be enormously enhanced by technology in the hands of teachers. But it will never replace the teacher because to strip it down to its essence, machines can't connect with children the way teachers can. Deep learning requires that connection. Education for global competence is perhaps in the vanguard of changes in how we organize uh, children's learning. But uh, it's really not just another kind of education reform. Rather, at least in our view, it's a new kind of social movement. Uh, in fact, in, in my view, developing in children a mindset not bent on domination, but for the common good is the social movement that's required. Uh, it's how we evolve toward a sustainable, livable 22nd century. So I hope that's a little bit of food for thought um, and I look forward to the Q&A and I'm gonna turn it now over to Neelam who will uh, carry on from the center's perspective. Neelam? Great. Hi everybody, thanks Tony. Um, my, as mentioned earlier, my name is Neelam Chowdhury. I am the Executive Director of Global Learning Programs at the Center for Global Education at Aegis, at Aegis Society. Um, and that's a little bit of a vague title, but basically my job there is to design professional development, curriculum materials, um, any content for our international schools network, um, or frankly, any teacher or parent interested in learning more about global education, UN Sustainable Goals, 
and um, how to assess all of this work. And so I do have a lot to share with you. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I might have to stop my video and share my screen. Just give me a moment, please. All right. All right, there we go. Hope everybody can see that. Okay, so the first thing that I wanted to share with you is a publication that was uh, re recently released. Um, and I don't think Tony uh, mentioned it, but I definitely wanted to um, let you know about it because it is one publication that I believe really defines what we mean by global competence, um, how we really look at global issues and how you can teach and assess to some of these issues. And so um, education, educators and education systems worldwide are reassessing the knowledge, skills, and dispositions students need to succeed in today's rapidly changing and complex world. Um, the OACD and the Center for Global Education at Asia Society have worked with academics, educators, stakeholders in, global, in the global education field for over several years to define global competence for primary and secondary education. And so this publication called Teaching for Global Competence in a Rapidly Changing World, which is easily available on our website, and I highly encourage you to take a look at, um, really kind of takes a look at how to embed global competence in um, existing curriculum, instruction, and assessment already happening in schools. So one thing I'd like to stress is that a lot of our work is not about an additional textbook or an additional curriculum. It's about how to integrate um, global competence, US sustainable, UN sustainable goals already into your already existing disciplines um, and content areas. And so our approach is pretty simple. We want to make sure that, uh, you know, what we're providing to students is relevant, that it is actionable, and that for teachers, it is systematized because a lot of this work can be quite complex. Um, it is not something that is, um, uh, easy to understand. It takes sometimes it takes years to kind of perfect. And so by providing tools, frameworks, and a system to uh, design this work and to integrate it into your classroom is really critical. And so what I'd like to do uh, through this presentation is kind of quickly go through what we mean by relevance, what we mean by actionable, and what we mean by systematized. And I'll be sharing some examples with you. So relevancy is the UN Sustainable Goals. So for those of you that are not um, clear on what these are, um, the UN Sustainable Goals are the blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. They address the global challenges we face, including how re uh, uh, challenges related to poverty, inequity, climate change, environment degradation, peace and justice, how these all kind of fit together in our world, how these issues, um, you know, create uh, problems for students and people all around the world and what we can do to solve them and to help make the world a better place. And so if, according to the UN, these 17 goals um, must be acted upon now and they have been for about the last 10 years and it's important that we achieve them by 2030. And so what I'd like to do here, if I may, is to quickly take you to the UN Sustainable Goal website And here you'll see all of them listed out. And as I mentioned, um, there are goals on you know, poverty, climate change, equity in education, which is very relevant uh, to a lot of the work that we do at the Center for Global Education. And if you click on any of these, you will be able to read more about the goal. Neelam, I'm not sure yeah. the audience is able to see the website. Uh, that's oh. probably in a different window on your computer. You may need yeah. to uh, choose, that's okay. choose share screen and then go to that. Right. Okay. Sorry about that. How about if I, can you still see my screen? Uh, what we're seeing is your presentation. Right. Okay. Now I'm going to see if you can see the website now. Can you see the website now? There we go. Okay, great. Sorry, I wasn't sharing my entire desktop. 
Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so here you see uh, the different goals listed. And um, if you click on, or if you, you know, hover through on any, either of the, any of them, um, you'll be able to read more about the goals. So this is another website that I really encourage some of you to, you know, take a look at if you have not looked at before. But they really kind of, um, in, in very easy, clear language, define what the goals are and um, what some of the expectations are for countries and how to reach these goals. Um, the UN Sustainable Goals, I think, also provides students a very good framework for some of the issues that are global issues that are out there and how they can uh, really think about making improvements in certain areas. As you know, um, students in elementary, middle, and high school are very motivated by um, issues of global significance. They are fascinated by um, learning more about people that are not like them, learning more about other countries, learning more about some of the really difficult um, situations that a large population of our world is are dealing with. And so I really think it's a, a great way to kind of connect students and get them excited about um, making real actionable and, and real making real change in the world. So I just wanted to you know share this uh, website with you because I do think it provides a very good um, foundation. Okay. So now when we talk about actionable, um, as Tony mentioned earlier, you know, we have a definition of global competence, which is really built around a, flame, a framework called the four domains of global competence. And the idea here is that globally competent students have the knowledge and skills to investigate the world, recognize perspectives, communicate ideas, and take action. And in order to investigate the world, students are you know aware curious interested in learning about the world around them and that's as mentioned earlier that's a very easy for us to do because kids are naturally uh, very curious about what is happening in the world and very motivated to do something about things that they feel are unjust or um, issues that they think um, they can improve on so i think that's some of the one of the most great things about um, working on global competence it's just a very easy thing for us to work with students on. So um, in terms of actionable, a lot of our work is um, really framed around if you're learning about a certain topic and now that you, you feel that you know, you've researched something, you're an expert on it, well, what is it that you're gonna do about it? How are you gonna take action? And so that is kind of a, a critical piece in our work. And finally, systematized. So here you see um, one of our uh, frameworks, which we call the SAGE framework. And um, the way we look at this is that when we design learning experiences for students, it's important to have a roadmap and to capture your goals and organize your plan. So our SAGE framework will provide teachers with the steps needed to start, to get started. The SAGE framework is a quality assurance strategy for performance assessments and also a way to think about student-centered learning environments. In these student-centered learning environments, the students take accountability for their own learning rather than being passive recipients um, of lessons and lectures. The kind of environment um, teachers, this kind of environment teaches students to be proactive about learning, which in, in itself is a critical global competence. And so here you'll see uh, the framework, which is really around four main things. So we wanna provide students with choice. And this is the time when a lot of teachers will um, encourage students to look at the UN Sustainable Goals or think about global issues and students make decisions on what they wanna study. The second is authentic experiences. So we wanna give students um, an opportunity to show what they're learning in authentic ways. And I'll show you some um, examples of what we mean by that. Global significance, which we've been um, discussing. And finally, exhibitions to a real audience. So again, we want students to be able to share what they're doing in a way that is relevant and something that they would do in the real world. And so these are just some, um, this is just a, a, a framework that we use that is very popular within our uh, network and beyond. And it's really an easy way to kind of think about how to organize uh, your lesson planning. And so what I wanted to do next is to show you how we kind of bring this all together. So just as a reminder, we wanted to look at how this, um, our global competence work is relevant, how it is actionable, and how it is systematized. Okay, and so I wanna show you some examples of what this looks like. Okay. 
Okay, and this is on our website. It's free for um, any teacher that's interested. And it's um, our global learning section on our Center for Global Education website. And these are projects designed to address the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And um, here again, we describe global competence, how it relates to the Sustainable Development Goals, um, and some key principles to successful virtual learning projects. So, you know, the, early this spring, let's school shut down and teachers were, you know, forced to kind of do things from home. And so we wanted to provide them with some information or some quick tips on how to really think about virtual learning experiences if you are, you know, someone that's going to have to do that. And so first is offering plenty of options. Um, there needs to be some balance of on-screen and off-screen activities. Um, some of you may have experience, if your parents or your teachers yourselves, where your student is sitting there online all day, others, they get no screen time. So having that balance is pretty critical. Um, providing scaffolding, making sure there's equity. As we know, not all students have access to a lot of the software and hardware, so we have to think about that. And checking in a lot. So that's another key um, component of kind of, you know, teaching either virtually or when you're teaching even in person. But a lot of uh, these performance assessments and learning projects really require a lot of check-in by teachers. And as I mentioned here, our SAGE framework. And if you go to the website, you'd be able to download our um, planning guide there. And here are some examples and I'll take you through a few of them. So here we have a, a list of our units available. Here we have decoding information bias, exploring a free and fair press. Um, an example of students designing a debate podcast on the perspectives or perspectives on the coronavirus. Uh, students designing an infographic around the challenges of xenophobia. Um, students collecting or um, telling digital stories on poverty and hunger. And oral history projects, understanding the migrant and refugee experience. And finally, curation of digital resources around investigating oceans of plastic. And so I'll click on one of these, let's say, um, perspectives on the coronavirus debate podcast. And here you can see how we have put those three components again together. So this is aligned to the UN Sustainable Goal 3, good health and well-being. Um, quick description on um, what is a structured debate? How do I make this project authentic? Meaning, how do I now think about a UN Sustainable Goal that is going to address um, or that's going to align to the project that I want to do? And then we have an example here. If you click on it, and it's a very simple framework where, you know, the teacher would put, jot down just to get started. Um, student choice, how is student choice going to be addressed in this project? How is this project going to be authentic? How, um, what is the global significance? And how students are going to be able to exhibit to a real world audience. And then we also have a few resources here. And the other thing that we do at the Center for Global Education is we connect the um, either the topic or the project to content that we put out through our policy institute or through our um, other channels within Asia Society. So there are webcasts. Um, here you have a, a ton of resources by our policy center provided around the coronavirus. And so it kind of gives uh, the teacher a holistic understanding or an opportunity to kind of bring in multiple resources to put together a project for their students. Um, and then I can share probably one more. All right. Um, let's say we take a look at uh, digital resource curation, investigating oceans of plastic. And here it's a similar, um, kind of framework where we have the alignment. So this one is aligned to the Sustainable Development Goal 14, Life Below Water. Um, and again, a description, how to make this content relevant or authentic, and then the framework, and then additional resources that students or teachers can kind of take a look at that are produced by Asia Society. And so basically, the, what I'd 
wanted to share with you all, and I'm going to kind of stop sharing my screen so I can see you all again. There we go. There we go. Um, the main point that I wanted to share with you all is that the UN Sustainable Goals um, are vast. There's so many things that you can um, look through, think about, research. But I think um, the most important thing for teachers and to schools to understand is that it has to be, there has to be a way for students to actually research all of that content and then really show what they know and kind of take it that next step and how, think about how they're going to take action on some of these issues. And you heard Tony speak about um, recent current events and um, this idea of teaching for the 22nd century. And that idea really is um, uh, just so well suited to, you know, thinking about kind of the work that we're doing um, in general, because a lot of this work is about getting kids to think about the future and think about, you um, you know, how they're going to kind of build careers uh, based on some of these issues that they're looking at. And um, so, you know, that's really what we kind of wanted to share with you here today is that, you know, you can, you can think about issues of global significance, you can think about UN Sustainable Goals, you can think about teaching for the 22nd century, but what does it look like in the classroom and what are the tools that you can use um, to help you get there? And so these are just some of the tools that we have. If you take a look at our website, we have a lot of assessment um, resources as well, including rubrics, performance outcomes. We also have um, uh, uh, um, lesson plans in some ways, which you know we don't like to call lesson plans, but they're kind of, and I use the word framework a lot, but they're um, you know documents that kind of help you think about some of these goals and how you're going to you know, incorporate them into your elementary classroom in third grade or your 10th grade biology course. But just, you know, a ton of examples on how you can integrate some of this work in any discipline at any grade level. And so that's, you know, I, I hope that you would be able to um, take, take a look at that or take advantage of it. And it's really easy if you just go onto our website. Um, and I think I just wanted to share our website here. Um, and my email. So if you have any further questions, you're welcome to contact me. And I think that's all for now. I think we, we could take questions. Now that is terrific. Thank you so much, uh, both uh, Neelam and Tony for giving us this. Several people in the Q&A section, and you're still welcome to submit questions, have asked about resources. And thank you so much for taking us to the website, showing us, you know, some of what's there. And there is a lot more to be found. Uh, these ideas, these, uh, and, and I think that that's what's key here is that you are able to meet the needs of teachers. The teachers have to uh, help their students acquire the content knowledge, but also develop these skills. And the example of developing a podcast, for example, uh, is a great one. How are you going to put this together? How are you going to bring in different perspectives into that discussion? And that's my first question to the two of you, uh, to Neelam and Tony. And this is something that you know came up over and over when you're talking about global competence. Uh, in this incredibly interconnected world, we need to be more globally competent, but it's also complex, right? And that's something that is so easily lost. Uh, in our desire to communicate, we boil things down, we simplify. In the political realm, it can it fit on a bumper sticker, that sort of thing. How do you work with teachers to embrace complexity? And how do you get students to be comfortable with complexity? Tony, do you want me to yeah. talk? Okay. Yeah. So students, like I mentioned, in, you know, when I was uh, during a presentation, students are the easy ones. They're fine with complexity. I don't think they, um, you know, are shy away from it. I think this work is definitely overwhelming for teachers, um, particularly if teachers feel like, oh, this is just another add-on. You know, I don't have time for this, that kind of thing. And so we do spend a lot of time showing them how to integrate this work in, in the content and the curriculum that they're already teaching. And we start very small. And so our professional development is really, we take it from very basics. What are the four domains of, comp of global competence? And how do you see that playing out in your classroom? It's very, you know, we take it 
from a very basic level. And as they get more comfortable with thinking about some of the complexities, like, okay, well, now I have to allow my students to, you know, speak their minds. And sometimes they're going to get, things are going to get kind of heated and I have to be comfortable with that. So kind of showing them like, what does that look like? How much time do you give it? You know, when do you do it? How often do you do it? You know, how do you get comfortable with it? That kind of thing is a big part of our professional development. And so getting teachers themselves comfortable, getting them themselves familiar with global issues and the UN Sustainable Goals, getting them familiar with how to integrate some of this stuff. And it doesn't have to be so difficult. Um, that is a core part of a lot of our professional development at the very beginning. Tony, do you have anything? That's great. I, I don't know if Tony, you wanted to chime in on this. No, I just, I'll just emphasize what, what Nita was saying around, um, at some point, it's also about um, letting the complexity of the world into your classrooms and not being afraid to just take it on, so to speak. I mean, because I think one of the things um, that really, I think, characterizes the schools that we've had a lot to do with in terms of, you know, helping them sort of transform themselves is that they go from places, um, well, they go to places that are incredibly engaging learning environments for kids because all of a sudden kids have a real clear sense of the purpose of why they're learning stuff. Um, I mean, I think one of the mysteries of the world for middle school students is algebra, like, what is this for? But when you actually can relate it to how you help understand things like the coronavirus, um, then, you know, all of a sudden it makes a difference. So um, as Neelam said, the, the kids are, are, are fine with and, and are, you know, um, hungry for the complexity of the world because they're sensing it um, and in effect we sort of do them a real disservice to you know, whittle it down to a set of uh, algorithms or, or just, you know sort of very 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 rarefied knowledge so um, it's it's letting go um, as well as bringing in I think more than anything else yeah the the messiness of reality right yeah. uh, is is so apparent to students that in fact if we try to boil it down into A plus B equals C, or if we try to boil it down into you are a producer, you are a consumer, as opposed to the reality is that we're both. We, we have all of that. I think that uh, in fact, students will see that as artificial. Uh, complexity right. is the reality. And so I, I really like some of the examples uh, that you both that you both brought in. Uh, you know, again, the notion of investigating the world, uh, developing empathy, and you have the other, uh, the other components. But several people in the Q&A have asked the question about empathy. And, and Tony, you said this, how do I get beyond me? How do I escape the prison of my own experience, my own moment? How do I escape that? And I'm curious what kinds of strategies you would recommend for teachers in helping them to do that with their students. I'll, I'll say a few words to start and then Neil can actually fill in the, 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 the answer specifically to your question about what teachers, um, how we help teachers do that. But I, mean, but I think, um, I, I think what the genius of what Neelam has done particularly um, and others within our staff is to take this big idea about how do you help kids sort of see the world from somebody else's perspective and break it down into um, sort of teachable actions that, and actually as well um, through what we call our performance outcomes, um, ways to look for evidence of, of, of students developing capacity around perspective taking in their work. And so we've, we've really tried to wrestle with this issue that, um, you know, you th this, this very kind of um, complex psychological phenomenon of being able to look to see others from their perspective can be can be broken down into sort of bite-sized bits and lessons and 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 and, and experiences and and, and repetition and, and and sort of uh, multiple opportunities to develop that skill as a reflective kinds of habit of mind so how we do that maybe uh, Neil wants to say a little bit more about it but it's it's really taking this big idea and putting it into actionable teachable terms yeah, and I can give you just an example of, um, you know, what we talk to teachers about or an example that we've given to some of our teachers, right when uh, the, the shutdowns happened and um, everyone was, you know, quarantined, working from home. Um, you know, the New York Times was publishing a lot of different articles on different, you know, 
communities and cultures dealing with the same issue. So one example, there was an article of a family in San Francisco, you know, both parents, um, highly educated, you know, working at Google or, you know, big companies, had, they had two kids and they were suddenly at home with these two kids, school shut down, taking Zoom calls at home, which we've all experienced and which we're doing now, um, and kind of the struggles that they were going through. So that was one example of, you know, a, a family dealing with uh, the shutdowns. And then they, there was another article that same day of um, uh, people in the slums of India and how are, how are they dealing with the shutdown. And for them, it was very basic. They didn't have food and they didn't have medication and they didn't have some of the very basic things that let's say this family in San Francisco struggling with had. And so, you know, taking these two articles, having students, obviously kids probably in high school would be most appropriate for this example, but you know, having them take a look at both of these articles and thinking about the differences of how the coronavirus shutdown, um, what it looks like for different people, and how you know those two different perspectives um, can actually build empathy very easily in students. You don't have to; everything doesn't have to be designing a whole unit and making a, this huge assessment. But it's really a you know helping if teachers can kind of just take small examples like that, they can start integrating issues of empathy and perspective taking in the classroom, I believe in very easy ways. So that's just a, an example of um, the kind of thing we encourage teachers to do. Now, th that's terrific. And that, that also echoes something that Tony said in the early going, where you know, teaching about the world is not something that you just do in my global studies class or right. something like that, that it needs to be integrated throughout the curriculum. And this is part of our big campaign, uh, you know, through this workshop and other, in other ways, we want to integrate the study of China throughout the curriculum and not to limit it, not to segregate it out into a particular place, but to bring it in. And that really comes through uh, from what you were just talking about. Now, one of the other things that both of you have highlighted, first of all, these are the UN sustainability goals, right? Uh, but also Tony uh, got really elemental at the beginning. He said, you know, this is survival of the species. Uh, this is what we are about, right? How we, how we uh, address these things. And that means looking at environmental uh, questions. Now, one of the things for this workshop is to emphasize the role of technology in our lives for good and for not so good things. And I was wondering what, how that fits, how uh, you, you are embracing technology by uh, saying, okay, develop a podcast. Now, 50 years ago, it would have just been an in-class debate, but now we can project it out, right? The technology has been democratized. We can project out what it is we've learned. So that's an example, but I was wondering if you could give us some others. Uh, the infographic that you scrolled past on xenophobia. Uh, kids love to try to think visually. And so I was wondering if you could expand on some of that, how students can embrace these new technologies or improved or more democratic technologies to become globally competent. Yeah. Do you, Tony, do you want me to go? Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah. So some of the other, um, so yeah, the, the, the debate podcast is very popular um, and it's fairly easy to do actually. And so what we also do for teachers is we provide um, websites that are free that um, where students could use and actually develop the podcasts. Um, another uh, popular project for students is developing social media campaigns. And this is another thing that's very easy for them because they're all on social media anyway. And so if any, you know, let's say the other issue that we, that I shared with you was around ocean, the issue of plastics in our ocean. Mm -hmm. So designing a social media project around that, infographics, developing websites. Um, and then also another popular one is uh, digital stories. I think that was on our list. I, didn't, I wasn't able to go through it. But um, there, that's just really, you know, creating a video. You can create a video and a digital story of your own background, background of your neighbor, of your grandmother, whatever it is. But anything to kind of help students to kind of develop this perspective taking um, uh, kind of view and put it in a way that is digitally 
interesting. And that way they are also learning about these quote, and I'm going to call them the 21st century skills, but these skills on how to use technology in a way that is relevant and that's going to get your idea that, that are going to get your ideas out there. And so this has, of course, because schools are shut down and a lot of this work is now virtual, it's kind of, you know, accelerated some of this content. But I would say I've been at Asia Society for almost for nine years now. And I would say the last two or three years, there has been a such a, requ a huge request by teachers to help them think about how to get some of this work, um, how to get students to do this work digitally. Because back, I would say even like five years ago, students were still developing portfolios and binders. You know, I'd go to schools and that was the way they were presenting their work. And that is almost, a lot of students are not doing that anymore. It's design a website, uh, do a digital portfolio, that kind of thing. So things are changing rapidly. And over the last few months, they've obviously, you know, things have moved much quicker. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add one thing. And it just builds directly on what Elon was saying. Um, you know, and it builds on what I was saying earlier about um, having to sort of let go. Um, uh, what's, what we also often find in our, our, our schools we work with is that as students, particularly as they embrace technology that allows them to get their, their voice heard, they do just that. I mean, they actually, it isn't just about learning to use the technology and to advance, you know, a particular idea, like to, to prepare themselves to do that when they're adults. It's more that we're going to do this right now. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of, it wasn't one of our students, but it's, there's an example recently where a 17 year old um, uh, had a, uh, initiated a, a global um, survey and uh, a petition um, that wound up uh, requiring or, or moving Trader Joe's, the, 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 the uh, supermarket chain, to rethink their entire way of labeling their, their, their food. I mean, that's, that's an example where a student taking initiative, um, using what they've learned, focusing on an issue, making it happen, and actually changing the world as a student, not when they get to be an adult. And so I think, frankly, that's exactly what we hope it will happen. We, we, want, we want students to not simply feel as though they're preparing to be good global citizens, to, to be good global citizens. And it isn't even just uh, high school students. I mean, when ki kids catch the bug of the, the fact that they can actually learn about the world and make a difference uh, in a positive way, th this is what really engages them deeply in learning. And, and again, it's about, it's about purpose and about um, you know, trying to actually do something to make the world a better place. And so um, it, is, it is really sometimes enormously gratifying to see what kids can do. And uh, it's helpful to, it, it feels good to help them do that. No, it's definitely gratifying, but the key point is the one that you made at the outset. They are acting for the common good. Yeah. They are getting engaged. And we have, uh, in addition to those examples, older ones uh, here in the Los Angeles area where the Los Angeles Unified was compelled to change their procurement program uh, for their soccer balls, for their gym clothes and things like that through student action, exactly. uh, student mobilization. They said, we want this to be, uh, these products to come from places where the workers are being treated decently, uh, where it's not child labor and things like that. And so definitely we have a lot of examples of, of that. Now I need to address a couple of the questions uh, in the forum. Uh, Bessie, the short answer is you are in the right place. Uh, this <laughs> is the Q&A forum. Uh, it, it is true that not all the questions that uh, I'm asking uh, are coming out of the forum. Sometimes they're coming from the, uh, you know, from the ether, but uh, in any case, you are in the right place and we encourage people to participate there. there uh, one of the things that, again, just to emphasize that I wanted to stress is the resource base that the Asia Society has put a lot of time and effort into. Uh, at USC, we also have a lot of resources. But one of the nice things at the Asia Society uh, with the China Boom Project and things like that, you can marry these short videos that are really classroom friendly to various topics. And those can be discussion triggers. And so this is really a, a resource. Now, Regina has asked, okay, but I teach Chinese. Do you have some stuff in Chinese? And I wanna broaden that question to address the issue of language because uh, I want to uh, push the idea 
that our diversity is our strength. And I know that you folks certainly believe that, but getting kids who may have come from other places or whose parents come from other places to embrace the language maybe that they speak at home. Uh, this is the language I, I use with my grandmother, but it's not the language necessarily that I use with others. And it is such a resource. And I'm wondering how language fits into the cultural competency that you were talking about, the global fluency that we all need. I just think in general, I mean, we've always defined, um, uh, when we think we have what's, what's called a global school design, um, and it's basically kind of the soup, the nuts of what we think schools uh, can do to advance global competence. And one of the core uh, areas that has uh, been part of every one of our schools that we've either helped create or, or help transform is that they really need to have a robust language learning program. Um, and often in other schools that we, we have been most uh, uh, closely linked, uh, that is um, often a Chinese language program, in addition to Spanish and, and other languages as well. So we absolutely agree that, that, um, that one of the roads to global competence is through language learning. Um, and it's, it's obviously for the purpose of communicating um, in that language. But it's also, again, a, another means by which you broaden the set of ideas in your head, literally, uh, because language is the codification of ideas. And when you have those ideas coming from different perspectives that are represented in language, it, it helps to build that empathy. It helps to build that, 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 that broader sense of like, I, I, there's more than one way to be somebody um, and to be a viable person in the world. And so um, it's really important. But I do also want to comment on the, uh, what you mentioned about um, about uh, learning one's own kind of, you know, home language, if you will, or, or, or language that your, your, your grandparents may have spoken and so forth. I mean, what I think you're speaking to there is, is sort of the idea of developing one's own identity to its fullest and to be fully embracing of the diversity that is within each of us. Um, and so I, I just really think that's really critical because what we're finding more and more now is young people are kind of constructing what my, what my colleague Veronica boyks Mancia calls hybrid identities where they're really embracing the differences that they are and that they have with, within themselves, within their cultures they're experiencing so that um, it, isn't, it isn't privileging anyone. It's really saying, I'm a, I'm a multitude of these things together. And so having language capacity um, is, is part of that. Um, we just think it's really, really critical. And, and I think you may know, some of you may know that we have a, a very extensive uh, Chinese language initiative, China Learning Initiative, actually it's called, where um, we do have um, a network of 100 China, Chinese language programs around the country that we um, kind of help spotlight their, their, their expertise and also provide professional development to them. And, and a, a ton of resources um, and another section of the website for ch uh, teachers of Chinese. Um, I think most of them are in English, but there are some in Chinese as well. Um, but that's certainly a huge area of our emphasis within our, our, our work as well. Um, and it has been really for a good well, actually, since I joined about 18 years ago, so absolutely. Just, now that, that's um, terrific. Uh, Neelam, I don't know if you wanted to weigh in. Uh, we only have a, a matter of a minute, uh, but if you oh, like to say I something. was just going to say that I posted uh, the link to our teaching resource hub for uh, Chinese language teachers. I don't know where it went, but I, <laughs> I, I, I put it in the chat somewhere. Um, okay, it is up. It, it will be there if it's okay. not already. Uh, we will make sure that it gets there. Okay. Uh, thank you both, Neelam, Tony, not just for the time you shared with us today, but how you've dedicated your lives to increasing global competence. Uh, you know, this is a great challenge for all of us. And I like the idea of putting it in a sense of competitiveness. Uh, you, this is, this is where we are and you need this. And for our teachers, they're of course working hard to make this the case. Uh, thank you both uh, to all, all who are, are watching. Take advantage of these resources. Mind the website. There are incredible, incredible tools there.